they were offering me uh, $400 a month to write songs. And at the time, being the poor college student that I was, and I said, I'll take it. <laughs> and I'm like, this song is not even about a real train. <laughs> it's like, you're not listening to a song. The vision for Long Black Train is just as vivid today as it was back then. I was a student at Belmont University here in Nashville, um, you know, a poor college student, and I had always been a big Hank Williams fan and knew about Mercury releasing the complete Hank Williams box set, and I was too poor to, <laughs> to afford it, because I think at the time it was being sold for over $200. And when I heard that Belmont uh, had got it on file at the music library, I was the first one in line to go listen to it. So I was in, in this little cubicle late one night with my headphones on, listening to most, if not all, of the, the box set. And there's so many songs on there that had never been released before. There's old radio shows, songs of just Hank and his guitar. And it just, in a way, it kind of transported me back in time. And as I was walking back to my apartment across campus that night, that vision came to me of this wide open space out in the plain somewhere. And I could see this train track running right down the middle of this wide open space. And there were people standing out to the sides of the track. And all of a sudden, this long, black, beautiful, shiny train comes roaring down the track. And they're admiring this, this beautiful train. But deep down, they knew that it led nowhere. It led to hopelessness and despair and emptiness. And so it finally dawned on me that the, the train was a physical metaphor for temptation. And so when I realized that, I knew I had something to write about. So I got back to my apartment that night, wrote three verses and a chorus, got up the next morning, realized it wasn't finished, so I wrote another verse. And even then, I didn't think anybody would want to hear it, but uh, I'm glad I was wrong. I think it's a, a message that I don't think will ever go away or fizzle out. I think it's something that's just as relevant, if not more relevant today than um, it was when I wrote it because I think I know everybody on this planet wakes up every morning with a choice to make. They can either give in to temptation or they can uh, resist it. And so we all have our own long black train that we're dealing with and it's a choice we make day in and day out and that never goes away. I remember I had a, a bed, a dresser, and a desk in my, in my room, and I had, <laughs> I had put these little hooks around the edge of the, the perimeter of the ceiling and had Christmas lights, like, you know, just hung around the, the ceiling um, for ambiance or whatever, but that's kind of what my apartment looked like. And then I, I went in there that night, sat down with my guitar, and I started strumming a B-flat chord for what seemed like forever. And, Next thing you know, the words just started coming out. There's a long black train coming down the line. And like I say, the first three verses in the chorus kind of came out pretty seamlessly. And and I woke up the next morning and I'm like, you know, there's something missing. I, I don't feel like it's finished. And I worked at the little clubhouse there in the apartment complex. So I took my guitar with me to work that day. And I was sitting behind the desk and there's nobody there and ended up writing the fourth verse and uh, and after that verse, I was like, it's finished. And a friend of mine walked in. She said, what are you working on? I said, I just finished writing this song. And she said, well, play it for me. I said, you're not going to like it. And she said, play it for me anyway. <laughs> and so I did. And uh, she loved it. I had me play it for another friend of ours. And it just started this snowball effect to where I ended up playing it for my junior recital, my senior recital. I did a demo of it there at Belmont. And then I was in a class called Entertainment Career Development where we had this project where we had to play a certain recording that we had made and kind of talk about it. And so Long Black Train was, was that song for me. And um, one of the girls in the class was interning for a publishing company here in town and, and wanted me wanted to take the, the demo and me to, to meet her boss. And, uh, and it, it ended up being Jody Williams and he helped me get my or he signed me to my first publishing deal and helped me get my, my record deal, which I'm still with MCA 21 years later, so. I thought it was too old fashioned and old timey and probably a little too deep for some people to get. It was so funny, even after the song was out and after the video was made, there was some, some group, I don't even remember their name, but uh, 
they were kind of attacking me because they thought the video, they thought I was using the video to encourage teen suicide by standing on railroad tracks. And, and I'm like, this song is not even about a real train. <laughs> it's like, you're not listening to the song. You know, so that uh, was kind of frustrating, you know, when I was being judged for something that wasn't even, that didn't even exist. Like I said earlier, you know, we all have our own long black train. I, th I think in the video, we did a pretty good job of per portraying all of those different things that people struggle with, whether it's, you know, gambling or alcohol or obesity or, you know, drugs or what, what have you, um, or just simply telling the truth. You know, and I, I, like I say, I think it's more relevant today than it was even back then, but we all have those choices that we are allowed to make and, and it's up to us, you know. The train tracks in, in that song and in that vision and in that video kind of represent our path and, and the, the, those tracks don't always go in a straight line. They curve, they go up, they go down, sometimes it forks and, and it's up to us to, to determine the speed and the direction and whether or not we even get on the, that train. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it, life can be hard in a lot of ways, but the chorus in the song is the redemptive thread in that um, because there is a way out. That classmate of mine who took it to Jody Williams, he wanted to meet me. I had already tried to negotiate a publishing deal with another company in town, which will go unnamed at this moment. Um, but uh, they were offering me uh, $400 a month to write songs. And at the time, being the poor college student that I was, I was like, man, $400 a month to write songs, like sign me up. And so we were in the process of negotiating the deal. And I don't remember why, but it fell through. And so I was a little disappointed. So the day that that happened, I called up my classmate and said, hey, does Jody still want to meet me? And she said, absolutely. So I go in, sit down in, in Jody's office, and uh, he starts talking to me about my writing and how much he loved Long Black Train. And, and he said, I think that song alone is enough to, to sign you to a publishing deal. He said, how does $1,500 a month sound? I said, I'll take it. <laughs> and so uh, I signed my publishing deal shortly after that, writing songs at Jody. I uh, sign a production deal with him, so he's working up this plan to try to take me to, to labels. And during that time, I had gone home for spring break, fall break, something like that. I was at my sister's softball game, and I get a call from Jody, and, and I answer it, and he said, Josh, I got great news. And I said, what's that? He said, I just got Long Black Train put on hold with Alan Jackson. And I said, say what? He was like, yeah, isn't that great? And I said, no, that's terrible. You call him back and tell him that, that Alan can't have that song. And he said, what, are you serious? I said, I'm dead serious. I was like, that's my song. That's nobody else's. And, um, and so he was just like, I just rained on his parade. And so he was like, okay, if that's what you want. I was like, yeah, that's what I want. So he had to call and, and get it taken off hold. And next thing you know, I'm playing it on my Grand Ole Opry debut. And it's the title track to my debut album becomes my first hit, my signature song. It helped me buy my first house. You know, it uh, it's influenced and impacted so many different people throughout my life and my career, and, and it just really kind of taught me the how powerful music is and can be. I came to town to be an artist and a singer. I, I didn't come to town to, you know, write songs and pitch them to other artists. That was not my goal, never has been, still isn't. I'm, I'm flattered when another artist wants to cut one of my songs, but I'm not out there beating the streets, you know, trying to, you know, get people to record my music. That's never been my my ambition. So I, I uh, as flattered as I was, and I love Alan Jackson, he's a huge influence on me as an artist and as a writer, but, uh, you know, Go write your own songs, Ellen. <laughs> There's been a lot of stories, you know, similar to that. Um, not everybody has really gone into detail about how that song has, has you know, impacted them. There's, there's been people who have told me that that song has saved their life, but they didn't go into as much detail as that woman did. And I think because she was the first person to tell me a story like that, I think it was just ingrained in my memory. You know, and like I say, she was not the last person to tell me a story like that, but I think the significance of her telling me that story was was when I, I realized I wrote that song by myself as a college student, unmarried, in my room by myself. I wasn't thinking about anybody else. I, was, I wasn't even thinking about a record, to be honest, but 
the reason I came to Nashville was to get a record deal and to be a star and to live the glitz and glamorous lifestyle. And when she told me that story, it made me realize, wait a minute, it's not about the glitz and the glamour. That's just, that's icing on the cake. That's fun stuff, you know, but that's not, that's not what it's really about. It, it's about saying something that means something and impacting people in a positive way because I have a platform and I can either use it or abuse it, you know, and I've always said I hate going into a movie theater and watching a movie and walking out feeling worse than I did before I walked in. And I'm the same way with music. I don't like music that makes me feel bad or makes me feel crummy. And so I don't want my fans feeling that way when they come to one of my shows or when they listen to one of my records. I want them to, you know, when they leave my show, I want them to say, you know what, next time he's in town, I'm gonna come back. Or the next time he puts out a record, I'm gonna go buy it. And they don't even have to sample it online. They can just go buy the record because they trust, you know, I've earned their trust. And that's, that's what I aim to do each and every time I make a record, do a show, whatever it may be, because like I say, there's, there's people listening that I may never meet. I try not to think about it too much because that can kind of handicap you, but it is definitely, you know, part of my thinking as far as when it comes time to make a record and, you know, because once you make a record and put it out there, it's, it's said and done, it's signed, sealed and delivered and you can't get it back. It's not like these new text messages where you can unsend them. <laughs> There's, there's a lot of dishonesty and a lot of, you know, division in today's world. And, you know, there's a lot of people who maybe uh, didn't have a solid upbringing that maybe are, you know, their heads spinning and wondering which way, which end is up and which way is the right way. And, and they might be confused about things. And so, um, you know, I think Long Black Train kind of speaks to that and, and allows people to understand that, yes, there is truth out there. Um, you just got to seek it. Because it's not just about me, it's, it's about the, fan, the fans that have been loyal all these 20 plus years and, and they've supported me through that song and all the songs since and they've come to the shows, they've bought the records. If it hadn't have been for them, I wouldn't be celebrating 20 years of anything in this business. So, uh, you know, I have them to thank and so I want them to come out and kind of celebrate with me and, and so uh, I make sure that every night I go on stage that I thank them for their support throughout all the years because uh, they continue to blow me away. I'm continuing to play sold out shows and it's just uh, it's something I don't take for granted. Yeah, I mean, I, the show I played last Saturday night, you know, I, I come out, it's the last song of the, the set and I don't even have to ask people to stand up. They're already standing up and got their phones out and singing along and singing back at me and it's, uh, it's incredible, you know, to, to be able to see the life of this song over the last 20 something years, like I say, it's just, uh, I have to pinch myself sometimes. The first line of the chorus, you know, there's there's victory in the Lord. And it means that there's a way out. You know, there's a lot of people who think that, uh, you know, they can't escape the bad situation that they're in or they, they can't help the choices that they make and, and you know, that that's a lie. And so they need to, to believe that there is victory to be had. All they have to do is choose to embrace it. So, um, you know, and that's, that's true for anybody, you know, and no matter where you came from or how old you are or whatever, that's a truth that will never change. Thank you.